Inside the marble halls of Highbury stands a permanent tribute to perhaps the most influential figure in the club's history. Herbert Chapman joined Arsenal in 1925 from champions Huddersfield and transformed his new team into the major force in the English game. I think he was tremendously important. Um, we were unknown when, when he came here, really, and he somehow set the thing in motion that people who followed him managed to uh, continue. And um, I would think he's really the most important person that Arsenal Football Club has really ever had. Chapman's first signing was the legendary Charlie Buchan, an inspirational captain. Then there was Joe Hume from Blackburn and future skipper Tom Parker from Southampton. This team took Arsenal to their first cup final in 1927 against Cardiff at Wembley. King George V was introduced to the Arsenal team by Charlie Buchan, their captain. Cardiff's captain, Fred Keenor, tossed up and Buchan won his call. Thus began a match that was to make history. In the Arsenal team were names that will stand forever in the Golden Book of Soccer. Men like Joe Hume, Jimmy Brain, Tom Parker, Billy Brythe and Bob John. In the second half, Ferguson shot at Arsenal's goal and he'd scored. Goalie Dan Lewis had let it slip through his fingers. Lloyd George and his daughter Megan acclaimed Cardiff. The slow motion camera records those fateful seconds. Watch how Lewis gets a firm hold of the ball and then by a touch of the elbow puts it into his own net. Did it slip on his jersey? Was he too eager to collect? It's a goal that's been argued about ever since. Anyway, one thing's certain, it won Cardiff the Cup. As the 20s drew to a close, Chapman continued to build his team. Players such as Eddie Hapgood, David Jack, Alex James and the prolific Cliff Bastin were signed and became Highbury legends. Arsenal were now ready to take on the football world with their revolutionary WM formation. The game would never be the same again. These are the Arsenal players from whom the final selection of the team will be made to appear at Wembley on April the 26th. This happy band of brothers was on the verge of making history, and that elusive first trophy wasn't far away. Ironically, the 1930 FA Cup final was against Huddersfield, Chapman's old club. In tribute to the manager, both teams ran out side by side, the first time this had happened at Wembley. The game went to plan for Chapman and his assistant Tom Whittaker, Alex James giving Arsenal a first-half lead. However, causing a bigger distraction was a German Graf Zeppelin that flew spectacularly overhead. In the 83rd minute, Jack Lambert sealed victory with this goal and captain Tom Parker lifted the cup to mark the start of a decade of Arsenal domination in English football. I need hardly say how pleased I am we have won the cup this afternoon. I'm very proud of the fact that the Arsenal has been successful in bringing the cup south once again. The first championship followed 12 months later in 1931, with Arsenal scoring an incredible 127 goals on the way to the title. The Gunners were a potent force, and everyone in the country wanted to see them at first hand. Many of those on the hillside have already paid admission to the ground. However, they think the view is better, even a quarter of a mile away. Well, they know. In front of 67,000 people, this sixth round FA Cup tie was finally settled by a header from giant centre-half Herbie Roberts. Arsenal were on their way back to Wembley, where they would meet Newcastle United. In a keenly fought north-south battle, it was Welsh half-back Bob John who gave Arsenal the lead, much to Chapman's delight. He was never one for outlandish celebrations. But the equaliser from Boyd was given in the most controversial of circumstances. From a high angle, it appeared winger Richardson had run the ball out of play before crossing, a fact confirmed by this artist's impression. Newcastle went on to score again and win the game 2-1. But defeat didn't keep Arsenal down for long, and a season later they went on to win the league, for the second time in three years. One important development was the new kit, their now famous white-sleeved shirts introduced in March 1933. This time the Gunners hit 118 goals on the way to the championship, and in 1934 the title again went to Highbury, but by then their inspirational guiding force was no longer around. On the 6th of January 1934, Herbert Chapman died from pneumonia. All of football mourned his passing, with the streets of North London lined with grieving fans. 
His legacy was more than titles and triumphs. He set standards that continue to this day at Highbury. In his time, he revolutionised tactics, training, the kit, and he even ensured that the name of the local underground station was changed from Gillespie Road to Arsenal. I think he was a, very much a revolutionary. I think he was way ahead of his time. I obviously, I never knew him, but um, my father always said that he ought to have been Prime Minister. I mean, he was of such a calibre, um, really an outstanding man. Loyal servant George Allison stepped into the breach and the club continued to go from strength to strength. Chapman may have died, but his football philosophy lived on at Highbury. I'm here today with the Arsenal football team and in a moment you'll see just what a fine lot of fellows they are. We're all looking forward most eagerly and in the keenest anticipation for the forthcoming season as league champions. We have the highest standard of football to maintain, and I sincerely hope and trust and believe we will maintain it. Prolific striker Ted Drake's signing from Southampton in 1934 ensured Arsenal's success was perpetuated. It was George, George Allison, and his very first signing, so maybe I might have been dear old Herbert's last, but I wasn't, but I was George's first. And uh, he had a hard job, you know, taking over because Herbert Chapman had set such a great example and whatnot. But George Allison and his players and his team and his trainers and his squad lived up to it, yes. If you look at his record, he did very well. George Allison guided Arsenal to back-to-back -to -back titles, making it three in a row for the club. Their record in recent years and the many star players they've captured have made the Arsenal here playing in white shirts the most talked-of team of this generation. Wherever they play, record crowds are there to see them. The Arsenal don't believe in stunts. For them, it's steady groundwork, tuning muscles up to the highest pitch. Here on the left of the trainer is Hume, famous outside right. And there's Alec James, right in the middle, one of the greatest soccer players in the world, in the middle of the picture again. Outside left, Bastin gives further proof of his versatility. The Arsenal paid 2,000 pounds for his transfer from Exeter City but he certainly justified it. The Arsenal team have reached an extraordinarily high standard. So long as they keep it up, they'll always be taking the ball into the opponent's half and putting it into the net, just like this. Soccer again, and the league teams come out to throw their thousands of supporters, nearly a million of them all over the country, and about 70,000 at Highbury to see the Arsenal, last year's champions, play last year's runners-up, Sunderland, in striped shirts. The Arsenal play like the champions they are, and give the Sunderland defence a most uncomfortable time. Two of their three goals are scored in the first half, Drake netting the equaliser. Now the Arsenal have it all their own way and keep up a continuous pressure. Bastin puts them ahead and most of the crowd realises that soccer has really begun. Drake kicks off for Arsenal in the league match against Villa wearing white shorts. Villa have brought in so much new talent that they are known as the Bank of England team, but they have yet to prove their sterling worth. Arsenal goes quickly ahead thanks to their centre forward Drake, who has apparently decided to win the match on his own. Continuing his display of brilliant opportunism, he plays ducks and drakes with the Villa defence. Villa's expensive experts are unavailing, and Drake scores at regular intervals, getting two more in the first half. To Villa's one, he gets seven, equaling the league record of 47 years standing. In 1936, Arsenal missed out on the league, but still found success in the FA Cup. The semi-final against Grimsby was settled by Cliff Bastin's goal. The Gunners were back at Wembley yet again. The final itself was against another Yorkshire side, Sheffield United, but due to a dispute, no newsreel cameras were allowed inside the ground. Those not fortunate enough to be there had to be content with this very shaky aerial view of the match, not the best angle from which to see Ted Drake score the only goal. The Cup was paraded around North London aboard an open-top bus the next day. There was good reason to cheer, and in 1938 it was followed by another league championship success, Arsenal's magnificent seventh trophy of the 1930s. 
There was no doubting the club's big box office status. Program, official program, and James. Thank you. Program. Here you are, Fountain of Arsenal. Soldier, soldier. Where are your colours? What the hell is it you think I'm wearing? Up the Arsenal. Up the Trojans. Arsenal. Above all, boys, you must respect this amateur side. They're one of the finest amateur teams we've seen for years. They don't play your game, they play the attacking game. Ball goes up to Kirshen. He's racing on. He shoots. And a grand save. Corner against Trojan. Oi, Rat! Oi! Don't keep blowing that whistle. Blow your nose down there! Yeah. <laughs> Nearing the end of the first half now, and there's no score yet. Drake's onto it. Over to Kirshen. This time it's a goal. First club to the Arsenal. One nil. And about 30 seconds to go for half-time. Even in the movies, it finished 1-0 to the Arsenal. Sadly, though, the team's success was curtailed by the outbreak of the Second World War. Normal football was suspended as the country's young men were called up for military service. Arsenal's star players were no exception. However, there were still occasional matches, and in 1943, Arsenal reached the wartime cup final against Charlton Athletic. When the teams came out, I bet there were down few among the crowd of 75,000 who could have guessed a score of 7-1 for the Gunner. It was hard luck for Charlton that their first appearance at Wembley should have been the occasion for a record total of goals against them. There was a sixth goal and then a seventh. And this is Lewis scoring. The Duke and Duchess of Gloucester were present and the Duchess presented the cup to George Mayer.